Okay, Sherry, you're good to go. You're just muted. Is that fine? Can everybody hear me? Yep, you're good. Okay, excellent. Hello, everybody. Uh, those of you who are in the space, happy to be with you this morning and uh, talk about drum fills, fun with fills. Um, this is, I want it to be very uh, open and, and relaxed and casual. So if anybody has any immediate questions or at any time, just pop right in and uh, hopefully I can answer them for you. Um, a drum fill is one of the most exciting uh, things that a drummer gets to do. Uh, they are improvised by nature. Um, everything that you've listened to, that drummers play that sound exciting and uh, in the moment and spontaneous and creative, uh, those elements of musicality that kick a band into high gear and that doesn't matter if it's a trio, even a duo sometimes, and certainly it's one of the most uh, crucial components of big band drumming, are improvised. Those things are improvised. And while many, many educational oriented charts have written out drum fills, and they're, they're so helpful today, similar to written out bass lines or, and chord voicings and chord rhythms for comping instruments. Most of what drummers do that's exciting and musical, and in fact, all of rhythm section players do, is improvised and um, responsive to the music going on around them. And I think um, regardless of the level of experience that your students have, instilling that in them um, as, a, as being as, as important as reading the written notes is the part, the listening to the music going around them and um, hopefully uh, listening to examples of the type of music that they're playing. That may, 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 see, may seem obvious, but sometimes it's not. I've even had some, some college students um, be confused about trying to play a Count Basie chart while they've never listened to Count Basie. I know it sounds, it probably <laughs> sounds insanely ridiculous, but that's a true story. Uh, anyway, so some tips about well, ways, ways to play fills and what they actually mean. The number one thing that you should remember is that the most crucial note of a drum fill is the note that immediately precedes the written figure that your ensemble is playing. And let me reiterate, it doesn't matter if it's trio or if it's a big band. Um, so that is the number one rule for playing a drum fill. It doesn't matter if it's a four measure fill, a, a two beat fill, or any, any length of measures or beats, the note that precedes the written figure that you want your drummer to set up is the one that matters most. And I'll give you some really specific examples of that in a minute. So that's, that's, the, first, that's the first crucial rule of filling. Um, and then the, the second part, which see, again, this is, um, I'm saying a lot of obvious things to you, I think, but the fill should be stylistically uh, right, in, right in the pocket of the tune that you're playing. I've seen a lot of young drummers, especially you're playing a, a reference count Basie again, probably most of you know Basie, like a real swinging chart and your drum student has practiced all these things and they have like maybe two or 25 bass drum pedals. So they get to that moment of like drum fill and they just start playing all their rock and roll licks or heavy metal licks in the context of a chart where it doesn't belong. Now, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I've heard that so many times and uh, whereas those fills are fun and exciting, they don't always necessarily match the vibe of the music. All that seems obvious, but it's something to just reiterate to your students. This is swing, this is a uh, bossa nova, this is a samba. You know, this is a old time swing. This is more bebop swing. This is a funk tune, whatever it might be. Uh, try to understand some of the characteristics of that, that music while you're helping your students play drum fills. So I wanted to play um, a, a minute uh, and, and Carolyn, you can please help me. This is a, just a sample of, and you, and you should have the music for this. It's called the rhythm changes. It's a piece of music that you can look at the top of it. And this is a, a chart that I wrote for my big band. And it was actually based off of a, a uh, fill exercise that I share with my students because the way that I wrote it, it's got every downbeat and every upbeat in the measure, but it's, it, you'll, you'll hear it when you hear it and look at the music, you'll see what I'm talking about. But it's a great thing to practice. And what I'd like you to notice, um, we're just going to listen to 60 seconds of this uh, arrangement of my, this composition of mine. I, I want you to try to analyze, and it's, it goes a little bit, by a little bit fast, but see if you can analyze what rhythm I'm using primarily for my fill, because that's the point of this. And then I'm going to continue from there. So would you mind playing that, Carolyn, please? Thank you. 
Thank you. So can anybody write in the chat? Um, I know that, again, that was probably flying by kind of fast, but if you have the music in, in front of you, if you were able to download that, does anyone want to chime in and tell me what kind of fill I was playing? It was intended to be very, very simple. What kind of rhythm I was using in my fill? If nobody wants to guess, I'll tell you. <laughs> I'll wait a couple of seconds. Okay, well, I was playing quarter notes because a quarter note is one of the greatest fills that your student can play. A lot of times people make the mistake of thinking, oh my gosh, my fill has to be so complicated and so wildly involved that it has to be, you know, hip or sometimes, like I mentioned before, students panic and play the, the one lick that they've learned. And um, I remember to that end, I remember vividly, when it's, it's so many zillions of years ago, but my first time playing drum set in a big band, uh, the band director counted off the tune and I was I was so nervous. I just played as fast as I could. <laughs> I don't know why that was my that was what I thought would be a good idea. Just like bleh, go crazy out of nerves. And most students will understand where the quarter note pulse is in the tune that you're playing. So um, and that that example I played for you, the rhythm changes, um, the, the rhythm was ba ba do da one and two and four one. All I played was quarter notes throughout that. And uh, nobody in my band would have any question whatsoever how I'm setting them up. So they're, they're hearing the pulse of my fill in the quarter note, just basically you're filling in all the gaps um, or as many of the gaps as necessary to help the band come in in a rhythmically, a strongly rhythmically unified way. Uh, it's supposed to, a fill, an effective fill will take the guesswork out of everything for, for your band. And, um, and to that point too, it's kind of, it's uh, important for you to encourage your band and all the horn players in the rest of the rhythm section to listen to the drummer when your drummer learns how to do that. And uh, especially drummers and lead trumpet players have a unique and special relationship where, you know, you hear with the drummer. Sometimes the expression is called drop, drop a bomb, drops a bomb and the whole band knows when the drummer goes, vroom, bam, they know where to come in. That's kind of a, that's a, that's a fun thing to get that relationship happening until the, the drummer they're driving the bus and then, you know, the lead trumpet player comes in and, 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 and uh, leads the rest of the ensemble. But if everyone listens to the drummer, then it's going to be that much tighter. So that's uh, that's kind of in, in a nutshell. And if uh, you wanted to see, uh, hopefully everybody had a, a chance to download this page. I know it's backwards, probably you're seeing, but it's called Fun with Fills. And this uh, this rhythm I wrote on the top here, which is oh, four, four eighth notes and a quarter note, um, is something I took from the Basie band. And you probably um, may have heard something like this. ba ba do boo da Ba ba do ba da ba ba do ba da that kind of rhythm. And the famous drummer Joe Jones with the Basie band simply played two quarter notes. And like I said, with the example I played of my own band, that's the that's the essence of something so simple that's so effective. So um, just to hammer home that point, when your students are playing a fill and when you're helping them play a fill, it does not have to be complicated at all. It can just be simple quarter notes. The, the main objective is to make it feel good and that pulse and that sense of groove and style of the song does not does not change during the drum fill. Sometimes you hear a, a kid, you know, their, their time is good and they're, they're swinging along or they're really, you know, playing funky and they get to the fill and the time stops when the fill comes, when the fill, when they try to play a fill. And that's, uh, you know, that's always my, one of my old teachers used to call that groovus interruptus. So <laughs> you don't want that to happen, and especially if it's a younger player. One of the things you can do is just get them, just get them to play quarter notes in that, in that whatever the length of the fill is. Again, just to fill in the space initially and make it feel really, really good and solid. Or your student can keep their bass drum going in quarter notes or their hi-hat going on two and four while they're playing a fill. And that, that should really, really help. Um, Anybody have any questions about those simple concepts? Those are all, it's all a, it's all a true story. Everybody's good. Okay. Okay. Um, so I think about fills in three, let me go over and hopefully I'm just assuming that everybody has this up because I'm going to reference this part of the sheet right now. And hopefully you can practice this at home. I, I wrote out this where it says uh, on the bottom, it says, uh, for example, under number three, this rhythm, one, two, three, four, one and three, four and two, three and four, pop, 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 pop. That rhythm, we're all going to do a little experiment tonight. I'm sorry I can't see you or hear you, but I am, I'm 100% I'm confident that you're all going to nail this exercise. 
this is a fun thing to do with your students. And the reason I wrote, wrote this out is because similar to the example I played of my own group, this gives you a, an opportunity to uh, experiment with several downbeats and several upbeats that are very, very common, especially in, in big band repertoire. You see these figures occurring all the time. So uh, I think about fills in three separate categories. I mean, they're, they're all happening at all, all the time in any given chart, but there's the full out kick shout section in a big band. That's where your, your drummer should have, your drummer, as I mentioned before that phrase, you, you may have heard it, drive the bus. The drummer is the one that anticipates everything that's supposed to be happening in the ensemble. So your drummer, if the band is supposed to come in forte, but it's currently playing in a mezzo piano or piano, the drummer's fill to create the forte that's about to, about to happen with the ensemble. The drummer sets everything up and then has freedom in all those spaces for your, your one drummer to set up 13, 13 to 15 horn players or however many horn players are in your group. Could be a quintet, doesn't matter. That drummer needs to anticipate what the ensemble is going to do. So they fill in those, those spaces with that kind of energy. And so just re remember that sometimes I've, I've seen um, teachers uh, um, say to their drummer, you're playing, you're playing too, you're playing too loud because it's, so, it's a, it's a soft section. But as I said, if the, the band's about to go roaring into a shout section, your drummer's fill sets that up, sets up the, the excitement of the shout section. And, and like I said, at the beginning of this, that's one of the most fun things about being a drummer is you get to, you know, fill in all those spaces with some creative, fun, energetic fills that inspire the band and, and set up, set up what they're supposed to be doing. So that's the first category, that big all out shout, like uh, give the drummer some like woo -hoo moment. The second one is the more, a more subtle setup. That's where maybe it's a background figure or something that's, uh, you know, uh, happening or like an, a 2D ensemble or some, or a, even a, um, you know, where different sections are playing different rhythms and that's where the, the drummer can play more subtly and catch some of those, those figures and, or, or slightly set them up. And then there's the unison, um, the unison thing where the drummer's just literally playing the figures without a setup. So you as the teacher will have an awareness of those things. I mean, the shout section is fairly obvious um, when the whole band is playing in rhythmic unison and uh, more or less rhythmic unison and, and playing at a full volume. The other two categories are a little bit, um, you know, they, they need interpretation. So you would, you would help your drummer say, hey, you know, we need, we need some help setting up these rhythms in here or, hey, you know, just catch those with the band. So if we all could play this rhythm together, and I'm gonna show you to my point where the, it's the note before the written figure that matters to set up that figure. If you, if you could do this, if you could look at B, it says ensemble cue, and then drums set up, it's example B on the bottom of the page, fun with fills. So it's where the, the top line, we can just um, clap this, I'll play my bass drum, play with my left foot though. Hopefully you can hear the drums okay. So let's just clap the top line. All right, and I'll play quarter notes for you. Or actually you can just read the written example at the top too, it doesn't matter. So here we go, I'll count four, four beats. One, two, three. So let's, that's your ensemble figure. And now what I'd like you to try to do, and this is this is the uh, rub your belly, pat your head part of the part of the uh, <laughs> part of the day morning. Um, if you can do your, you can do this with two hands, or you can use a hand and a foot if you like. One hand I want you to play the bottom line, and one hand I'd like you to play the top line, the line that we just played. Um, so that's gonna, it, I'll let's just do that first, then I'll play it for you. How it, I'll play it on these two drums so you can hear the difference. So one hand is one hand is going to play the bottom line. One hand is going to play the top line, or you can use your hand and your foot. Okay, let's do actually let's do this first if you don't mind. Let's do the top line first, and then on this on, let's repeat it. And on the second time through, let's try to add your other hand if you can do that. Okay, so here we go. This is I'll do my bass drum again. This is this is B. We're going to play the top line, and we're going to repeat B. And we're gonna, then we're going to play both lines. Okay, here we go. One, two, three, four. Okay, any questions about that? If you could, if you could see, 
this is my, um, the one hand is playing the kick. I'll do it with my bass drum. So the, the top line, the written figure B is what the ensemble is playing. And I am kicking, and this is that point again, the note before the written figure, that figure, I'm setting it up and supporting it and underlying it with another limb. So if this was in the context of a, of a groove, it can be funk or any rhythm, but I'll, I'll play it and swing for you. So that would be like this. One, two, one, two, here's the figure. before the written note and it creates a really really nice a really really nice uh counterpoint to what's going on it fills in the space and it, it gives the ensemble your ensemble something to latch onto to help them anticipate well the, the rhythms but certainly the phrasing so then your your job as a teacher is when you're explaining these things to your drummers to say is to determine what written figure that really needs attention and what does not, because obviously a drummer doesn't play every single written figure that your horn players are playing. And that, you know, and that comes from, again, you, you as the, as the teacher listening and say, you know what, um, we really need some help in this section. Could you, could you give us the downbeat when the band comes in on two or the end of one? And, you know, you don't have to catch all those figures, just keep time going. So that's a, that's a, a stylistic, you know, and, and it's, it's an opinion, it's your musical taste and sensibility, what you want your drummer to do. But those three major categories that I just mentioned, you know, that's aside from the shout, because that's that, like I said, that's pretty obvious. And you, you as the teacher, because, you know, tell your drummer what you, what you need from them. Uh, so simple is the best way to go. I do every time, especially when you're sight reading something, you're never going to go wrong with simple. Drummers play for the benefit of the band. I had a, I'm not going to use all the expletives, but uh, <laughs> that my friend uh, Phil Woods, probably many of you know Phil Woods, I'm a great alto saxophonist, had a wonderful Grammy nominated big band, the Celebration Orchestra. Then he ended up uh, getting rid of his, his drummer, and uh, who was an extremely great drummer, played all these like crazy, like polyrhythmic, you know, nutty fills that crossed the bar line. And, you know, your brain would catch on fire trying to figure out where the downbeat was, <laughs> where, where one, two, three, four is. Uh, he knew where it was, but nobody else did. And Phil, you know, fired him. And uh, the reason is because Phil, you know, screamed, he goes, because I want to know where the blankety blankety blank downbeat is. I want to know where the downbeat is. So that's the job for, I, I think, especially in a big band, because there's so many people involved. You play for the benefit of the band, make it make it simple and make it feel really good for everybody. A um, couple more tips, uh, everybody, when, uh, with a big band, and I, um, I don't know if, if there's any questions about this, but do most people here conduct or work with a, a large ensemble, a big band? I don't know if Carolyn, there's a way to tell. I, I can't, I see people, I see people's names, but I don't know if I see anything in the chat here. Okay. Oh, haha. <laughs> okay. Hmm. I see some questions. And Carolyn, I, it's in, it's, since I'm, I'm talking and that my computer's uh, where I have to reach to read, this is a lot. So if there's a, it's a question, I just keep it simple. I'm reading the, sorry everyone, for my technical deficiencies. Hmm. Okay. Anyway, my question is if everybody has a, uh, a big, a big band. So I'm going to assume that you do, unless somebody has a specific question about a, a small, a small band. Just let me, just let me know. But so for a big band, one of the things that can be helpful is, as I mentioned this before, uh, uh, the drummer. There's one drummer. There's so many horn players, and let's just talk about the shout section for a minute. When you're, when you're doing that, and, and that's, a, 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 I'm going to re keep reiterating these points. The best stuff is always improvised. You get some of your greatest ideas for improvising from listening and stealing that. I'm sure this is all, I'm preaching to the choir and you guys know this for sure. Um, that's how I learned. I learned when I was in high school, somebody played me this record of, of Buddy Rich. Uh, we were playing the tune, basically the blues. I heard him do it, it took me a minute. I'm like, oh my gosh. And like a light bulb clicked off in my head about how I can steal, <laughs> steal, steal things from other players. So cannot do better than ripping things off from, from records. And I think these days, most of us have a, um, access to recordings of the tunes that we're playing with our, our students and our bands. So steal, steal things and then try to make them your own versus reading a written part. And this is, to me, this is so true for all rhythm section players. 
even if you're reading a written part, then you can tweak it a little, add a note, leave out a note, do something to it to make it your own. Students have a lot greater ownership of that. And it, it will help them remember it if it's coming out of their, their, their heart and their creativity versus uh, just reading something like a concert band part because that never, never sounds as organic to the, to the groove as it possibly could. Hey, Sherry. Yep. I've seen the question twice from Lee Hicks. Do you think giving the drummer the lead trumpet part is helpful for kicking the band? Yeah, hi, Lee. Uh, yes. Oh, my gosh. That's a great question. Do you think giving the drummer the lead trumpet part is helpful for kicking the band? Okay, then. <laughs> well, that was a nice one about Lee. I do think it's a, I think it's really, I think it's great. When I don't have, if I don't have a drum part, I always immediately go to the lead trumpet part. And, and a lot of times, um, Lee, you bring up a good point because uh, sometimes people don't know how to notate drum parts. I've seen drum parts that are so busy. It's like reading a concerto and it's ridiculous. And I've seen drum parts that have, um, it's a slash and it says play 16 slash play 32 and there's zero information. In the drummer's part. So yes, Lee, great, great point. Lead trumpet parts are great. And I often look at the bass part too to see what the bass line might be, especially if it's a you know a, a funk tune or there's something that's not normally straight ahead with just walking. But yeah, and if there's if your drummer has a part that doesn't have that info, number one lesson, listen and try to memorize it as, as fast as possible. Because my I took I studied with the great Mel Lewis. Many of you probably know him, Thad Jones Mel Lewis band, Mel Lewis Jazz Orchestra. Now it's called the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra. But he's, and this is a cliche, get your head out of the music, get the music in your head. Because when you're sight reading music and you're staring at the page and you're thinking about many things, you are probably not listening as hard as you should be. So as fast as you can memorize it, great. But yeah, Lee, thank you for that really super point. So with your one drummer, everybody, some of the things that, that uh, make the drums and the ex drums are sometimes called tub tubs. You know, we have expressions dropping a bomb, like all these things that are, you know, kind of, indicate loud and aggressive but what you want is a big fat full sound and one of those things that some of that has to do with the way that people it's not the, the rhythm that even your students might play even if they're simple court um, simple quarter notes it's the way that they're orchestrated so when you're playing a written figure everybody play uh, you, typically it's going to be with the cymbal and the bass drum supporting it so that figure that we were just talking about though one bum 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 that figure. If I'm a drummer and I'm playing along and the band is playing that and I just did this, one, two, three, four, one. one. Sounds a lot more supported and fat, which is what a big band needs. It needs fatness, P-H-A-T, underneath it to lift the sound of the ensemble. I like that idea of think of the drums as a big foundation, especially in the south shout sections, and you're you're lifting all the horn players. You're giving them a big cushion to play off of. So listen to it. If I add the bass drum, one, two, three. It adds it's it's much better. hopefully you can hear that okay, but it sounds a lot fat. It sounds better than just one. Just try to get the students to use the bass drum with their cymbal or however they're accentuating the written rhythm. The bass drum is the underlying punch. That's called a punch. So that's a good, that's always a number, number one. Number two, there's a couple of tricks that you can use. I hear students play, um, let's just talk about swing for a minute. But that, it could be true with any, any rhythm, but triplets, single handed triplets like right, left, right, left, right, left, remind me of the song. Um, you ain't nothing but a hound dog. I'm sure many of you heard, have heard that song. That one. So single stroke triplets like that, especially in the context of a big band, are, do not give you a full enough sound. It's it's very <coughs> snare drums are very staccato. It's not fat and full and like that. Oof. You want to kick your band into high gear. So one thing is simple. If if the tempo is appropriate, you can add a bass drum to that. But what I what I do often. If, is just do double stops between my floor tom and my bass drum. So then you have your fill, you know, I'll just do an example like this. Here's, this is the way that it um, probably doesn't sound as fat as you want. So if your students
patient's able to do that depending on the tempo. It's a lot better sound and you can always add the bass drum. Actually, depending on the tempo, mm -hmm. I like to do that fill a lot. My, uh, I, I once said to my band, I said, you know, I know it sounds like stripper triplets. So they cracked up laughing. And so now we call them striplets when I play that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, very, it's a very common, it's a big fat sound. So I'm sure everybody's familiar with rudiments. The drum rudiments is the foundation of what drummers do. So let me show you another super cool way to play triplets. If your students know a five stroke roll, then they can, they can phrase it like a triplet and it sounds quite amazing as a drum fill. So we take our, our I'm gonna say our lowly triplet, <laughs> Sub excuse me, subdivision of jazz. So it's obviously it's three notes. So for the sake of just ease of understanding, let's just call those one, one, two, three. One, two, three, one, two, three, four. If your student plays a five stroke roll, with triplet phrasing, it'll the triplet will sound like this. So a five stroke roll is right, right, left, left, right, left, left, right, right, left. It can sound like this. So I'll do triplets, just straight triplets first. Add the bass drum, regular triplets. Fatness to the phrasing. I use fatness because I mean in fill, like filling up the bar. With the, I like to think of tenuto phrasing too. It might sound strange because, as we men I mentioned before, the snare drum is very staccato sounding. But uh, if you, as the as the teacher in your mind, you think, "Oh my gosh, the, you know, it makes sense that a drum fill in the way you feel the groove, even if you're playing staccato, needs to be legato and tenuto because that's going to fill up the measure, big and strong, and I look forward fat without dragging. So that's really cool. Um, the triplet to the five stroke roll thing that we did, I just showed you. If you accent, if you play your roll right, right, left, left, right, left, left, right, right, left, and the single stroke of that five stroke roll is on the last note of the triplet, that even swings even harder. So then we go from the regular triplet. Uh, first way was the way, and now accenting the last note, check this out. you could tell your students to, to uh to do just move their move their accented hand or single strokes to a different drum you get a whole different sound and this is true with all all of these rolls five sevens nine stroke roll i'm sure we all know this from for marching band 13 stroke roll is a perfect bar of triplets check this out this is i like this one too well, let me show you oh, here's a seven stroke roll listen to this listen to this phil a great drummer philly joe jones did this quite a bit this is a seven stroke roll one two three four five six seven is it like a triplet? Check it out. One, two, one, two, three, four. Unfortunately for me, I don't know if I'm talking to mostly high school people or, or other otherwise, but most of your students will probably know a seven stroke roll to be able to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. And by the way, double strokes swing harder than single strokes. I probably should have mentioned that before when I was talking about the, uh, the straight triplet. Drummers have three things. We have single strokes, we have double strokes, and we have multiple bounce strokes. That is literally all, that is our full arsenal of the sounds that we can produce. Many shades of those three things that we can do, but those are the basic things that we do. So a double stroke, and you can, this is, I like this analogy very much. When you have your, your horn players, it wouldn't be tonguing every single note, you know, like some, there's slurs involved, there's different tonguing techniques. And so when we play double strokes, 
if we're playing them correctly, it is the uh, illusion or ability of, of the you know, illusion of um, us playing a legato or, or slurring notes instead of tonguing them all. So uh, again, the single with single strokes, double strokes. And to me, that's, that's, that's a great way to explain it versus a staccato, which you might want to call sometimes tongue versus legato, double stroke. I think they swing hard. So those are a few things. Um, the very, very famous fill, and I'll show you a couple more of these rudimental things you can teach your kids. The four stroke rough. It's such a common fill on the drum set. It's actually called bucket of fish. I bet you guys have heard this before. Our four stroke rough is... Uh, any rhythm. Rudiments are just sticking patterns like major scales are just intervallic relationship scales and patterns. So start, that's what we have sticking. So the bucket of fish fill that works in all scenarios, most people do it in the triplet. Let me bend my screen down for a second so you can see my floors. One, two, three. Snare so drum, high tom, four tom. You can do that in any subdivision. You can do this. Like a triple like I was. 16th notes. That's a great fill. Bucket of fish. And because you can assign any value to that, and you can put the bass drum on any part of the beat, upbeat or downbeat. It's a great fill. It's just so it's very very common. Like I said, not many drum fills have their own name, but that one does. Bucket of fish, dig it a bomb, dig it a bomb, dig it a bomb. Very very good fill. Um, does anybody have any, any any questions or anything about a particular chart or scenario you've been, you've encountered? We have a question from BJ. Uh, do you change equipment for big band versus combo or smaller groups with sticks, the drum set, etc.? That's, a, that's an excellent question. In my big band, I use a 20-inch bass drum. 20 and 22 is a good size. Um, and for, for a smaller group, I like to use a 18, but a 20 is okay. A 20-inch 20, 20 bass drum to me is all, all can be can function in almost any any size on but if, any size group. But if you have an opportunity, the smaller drums uh, sonically are better. Um, and usually in a small group, your drums can be tuned slightly high higher. I like my drums tuned low. They're kind of in relationships of Fourths or fifths, I like to give that big open, to, you know, open and like I keep saying this out, fat and low and lifting. I like to lift things from the from the bottom or sometimes coming coming from the middle, like a heartbeat. When I sit up in my band, I sit up like right next to the trombones. So I'm kind of almost in the trombone section. I don't set up back by the trumpets. I like to be in the in the center. And uh, that's, you know, for, for those reasons and with the lower sounding drums and open and open sounding. Um, a lot of people have real, uh, students like to have their bass drum stuffed with pillows and things like that. It's a really different sound. And it, mostly it, it sound can sound good and be fun to play when you're standing out in front when your drums are more open, they sound more resonant. I don't even know what the equivalent is of any other I I instrument. I guess if you're like trying to play a string instrument and you just had your hand on the string and it wouldn't vibrate. So that's what happens to drums when you stuff them full of things. But it's a very different sound if your student drum set or your students set their drums up to play funk music. It's a it's a much different sound. And it's it's a totally fine sound because you have drummers like Steve Gadd, Vinnie Colliuta, Dave Weckl, um, Jojo Mayer, those great, amazing, killer great players. But their drums are much, much differently tuned than like Amel Lewis or Jeff Hamilton and John Riley, Dennis McCrell, some of the other great um, current big band drummers. And mine, mine are all open too. But that was a long answer with some extra information there, but good question. Try not to stuff your drums, though, especially the bass drum. A little felt strip can muffle them very very, very well, but if you stuff it full of, I don't know, when you stuff it, like your whole drum is full of a pillow. I like think if you were singing and someone came up and grabbed you by the throat, <laughs> it kind of takes all the resonance out. And uh, not good for all kinds of music. Anybody else? Hmm. Okay. All right. Well, let's talk about uh, so the different different kinds of uh, grooves and how that might affect your fills. Well, I sort of did that in a very generic way, which is just talking about the how you can fatten up your fill, like by by using the double strokes or using the orchestration. Um, but let me take the same rhythm. And I don't know if you if any of you are familiar with the um, 
the Ted Reed syncopation book. I have it somewhere. I don't know where I don't know where it is. Right the, at the second, this is an excellent book for practicing rhythms. And, and I keep mentioning at the beginning the, the strongest uh, the strongest part of what your drummer is going to do is, is responsive to the music, is improvised. I know that's again can be very scary for young players. If they have no idea what to do for the fill. What, what am I supposed to do? The Ted Reed book. It starts with just quarter notes. The book is called Syn Syncopation. Reed is R E E D. Just every line of that. It's all four of our phrases. Ask your drummer can rehearse playing fills just using those written rhythms, just those written rhythms in all kinds of different styles of music. And then, like I said before, figuring out why is this swing phrasing versus funk phrasing versus other kinds of phrasing. So, you know, the, those things will be added to this, to these layers of practicing. But just if any of your students are like, oh, what do I, what do I play for my solo or my fill? Use the Ted Reed book. It starts with just quarter notes and then it goes all the way through to more complex and busier, busier phrasing. And then it gets into some deeper syncopation stuff, but it's, it's a really, it's really, really great thing to practice. So if you're playing a, uh, if you're playing a regular, like, let's say it's a, like a swing era, kind of a swing too, maybe not in the mood and we'll, we'll use this rhythm. Ba -da, ba -da, da, 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 da. I'm going to play that for four bars. We'll, 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 I'll, I'll do a two bar fill. It'll be, we can get through some more information if I do that. So, so the basic swing error groove would be, you know, You know, there's so many layers of this. I wish I, I could share with you for like 10 hours of all the ways you can use this. So I'll do that again. I'll do it in, sorry, I did it four bars. I'll do two bar phrasing. Swing arrow. <laughs> One of the things that makes drummers sound more contemporary in their playing and their filling is to use your feet as part of the as part of the fill pattern. When you're younger, you're taught. I was taught, you know, your feet are kind of irrelevant and just kind of chug along with these patterns, but your hands do all the fills. Well, that's just not true. And if they want to sound more modern, your drummer to sound more modern or contemporary when they're playing jazz fills, I'll do that same rhythm. But if I just orchestrate it slightly different and use my bass drum, or even my hi hat as part of the the, the texture of the fill, it's going to sound more, much more modern. So here's the swing way. Same rhythm, but if you think about incorporating your feet into the texture of the fill, that's really that's a really really great really really great thing to do. If you're playing a bossa nova or a samba slash Brazilian music, I'll use the same rhythm. You can one of the things you can do is add add texture to that by using some slight rim shots because that's a that's a very characteristic sound of uh, Brazilian and also Cuban music. So the same rhythm. So check this out. You can do that if you want to. And that's taking that same rhythm, and you can apply that to funk. You know, oh, let's see. Hey, Sherry. You have a couple of questions have popped up in the chat, and we have about five minutes, so um, I'm going to read them both. Uh, Lee Hicks um, wants to know, wants you to talk about ride symbols, ping rides, etc. Which one is better for big bands? Okay. And then BJ wants you to talk about getting drum students to think more musically. Uh, you seem to have a very strong musical st standpoint. So how do you 
how do we get kiddos to to play like you? Uh, thank you. Uh, so the, the ride symbols, I play. I have a Sabian endorser. I love Sabian symbol. This is their artisan line symbol. They're kind of they're they're dark with not many overtones, and this has to do with the, the stick that the, your students will be playing with too, which will have, help them cut through the band. But by nature, symbols are very high in pitch anyway, so they probably will cut through. Um, I'm not a giant fan of the strong ping symbol. Like Louis Belson is a drummer who I love that comes to mind that had a very pingy, almost anvil-like sound with no sustain. So it's your personal preference if you like that sort of sound, which will cut through the band, or more of a Mel Lewis, you know, Jeff Hamilton sort of dark, darker sound, like which I like, which is that this. And I have the same symbols with my big band and my trio, and I have rivets in it because I like the I like the wash, especially if I'm playing a ballad. You guys can hear that. I just play with my finger. Hopefully, you can hear it. It's just sustains a little bit. I like that. Now, if I was playing funk all the time or rock, I would I would choose different symbols. But for the mostly acoustic jazz that I play, these I love these. That was a great question. And the hi hat, you want it, you know, it, to be very very tight and, and uh, a chick sound. And one of those those things that students don't do is leave the pressure on their leg enough. So if I just put my foot down, it goes. Kind of like two pieces of lunch meat going together. <laughs> Instead of that, I'm using the weight of my leg, or even if you're just heel towing it, rock through. So, you, so this is one of the things that helps, especially when playing jazz. Really popping through. So, a symbol, a symbol that's, that's dry to your hi-hat symbols that have a nice tight chick will help the big band quite a bit. And I love the idea, that question about playing musically. Uh, I always say a lot of to, to my drum students, are like, me, drummer, not musician. I said, we don't want to play like that, you know, really. So one super great thing to do is, um, and I know the kids, probably high school students, maybe some of them don't have time to actually transcribe horn solos, but try to play melodies on the snare drum. I do that with all of my students. And I teach some high school kids to all my college students are playing tunes on the drum set. So pick you know something simple i'm sure many of you know the song now is the time get them to try to play the melody on this on the snare drum and believe me swinging on one drum is extremely hard if you can swing on one drum you got the whole world at your disposal as i'm doing double strokes sounds different than if i play Sounds different then. And then get your students. I found one of the most fun things to do is tell your students to play a melody, your drummers, and then have them come in and play the melody on the drums and have the rest of the band guess what song it is. A song that you're playing in band that everybody has heard a lot. And that's a great challenge to your drummers to start to think like, hey, I'm a melodic instrument too. So that's one really, really fun exercise. The drummers emulating the melody. Sherry, before we stop, because we're just about out of time, can you tell us the title of that book again? Yes, by Reed? yes. Ted Reed, R-E-E-D, Syncopation. Oh, here it is. Looks like this. Got it. Thank you. Um, it's a, a great book. So, well, you'll you'll see it when you. A, I, there's actually there's a there's a free PDF download. I think there's more than one on online where people can find this. It's a great great tool. And there are some other. There's a big band books at uh, Studio and Big Band Drumming by Steve Houghton. A book called Philosophy by Steve Fiddick, who used to be the drummer in the Army Blues. That's got some some concepts in it, but many many written out things. And again, I, I in jazz music, everyone, and I'm sure you know this. The, the really the and my gosh, especially especially when you're improvising and for rhythm section players, if your student can create something themselves, even if it's based on a written part, but just they tweak it just so it's theirs, it makes such a huge difference in their in their their ownership of the the music that they're playing. It makes a tremendous difference. But make sure they're playing in the style of the tune because it truly drives me insane when a we have Led Zeppelin fields on a Count Basie chart. Now you guys can write to me on any time on my website or my email. I'm happy to answer more questions and whatever else I can do to help keep the world swinging along with you, especially now. I think we are out of time, Sherry. I uh, just want to give you the biggest virtual hand clap that we can. Thank you so much.
You're so welcome, everyone. And uh, geez, have a great um, Thanksgiving and stay safe, sound and swinging. <laughs>